with those, and also I'd ask that you'd turn over to Mark chapter 6. So mark this place here in Matthew, and then in Mark chapter 6, a parallel passage, parallel explanation of what transpired. Mark chapter 6, if you look over there, and we'll see a little bit more of the account of what we're looking at. We're looking tonight about overcoming fear in the storms. Overcoming fear in the storms. In Mark chapter 6, And in verse 47, Mark 6, 47, we find the same passage, different, uh, more details about it. It says in verse 47, And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land, he being Jesus Christ. And he saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary to them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed he had been a spirit, and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and saith to them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased. And they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Overcoming fear in the storm. I look around tonight, even in our church right here, there's some folks that are in a storm. We all have storms. We all have some challenges. We all have some things that are kind of rough going for us. I was preaching part of this at our chapel the other day for our kids, and I look at our kids, and our kids go through the storms also. Parents, let me, have, let me help you remember something. Your kids are going through the storm also. As you go through a storm, it's important you realize that you've brought your kids along the storm with you. That's why you need to be strong. That's why you need to be right. That's why you need to be focused. That's why your heart needs to be right. Amen. Because your kids are going through storms also. We're going through storms. Different kinds of storms. Some financial. Some spiritual. Some physical. But you're going through storms. And I believe that's why God in His Word reveals so much about storms to us. And we fear in the storms. We become afraid in the storms. I don't know if many of you have been in actual at-sea type of storms, storms where the ship is rocking and rolling, where the ship has got its difficulties. I was on, as you know, on a submarine. Submarines, though they're not on the surface, they are called sewer pipes. I was called a sewer pipe sailor because you're just in a tube. That's what it is. It doesn't have a big keel. It doesn't have a big depth like that. And so when it gets into storms, it just, it just rolls. All right. It's just a sewer pipe sailor. And they're fearful things when you're at sea on, in a storm. Begin to wonder why we fear so in the storms. One is because we fear loss. We fear loss of life. We fear loss of limb. We fear loss of of what God has, has given to us. We're just, we're just afraid we're going to lose out. And so the storm comes and there's a fear associated with loss. There's a fear associated with the fact that we're out of control. I mean, we like to be in control. We like to make sure that we know what's going on. We like to make sure that I can make decisions, that I know what's going to do, and I can make sure that I'm deciding what's going to happen. And but in a storm, we fear loss of control because what happened we may not like. And yet we know that God has not given us a spirit of fear. It says in 2 Timothy 1.7, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So even in the storms when we begin to fear, we need to realize, no, God's not given us that spirit of fear. He's given us that spirit to help us of a sound mind and of power and of love, but not of fear. So yes, we're in a storm, but we should not have that overwhelming fear. We should not have that fear that drives us to make decisions we should not. We should not have that fear that brings us to the place of doubt. First John 4.18 says, For there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear has torment. We fear in the storm. We find the disciples here fearing in the storm. Fear, if you can picture it this way, is like the old balance, the old scales, fear and faith. Life is kind of a combination of both, fear and faith. 
The goal is to have a lot of faith which will balance out and overcome fear. So tonight as we look at this, our goal is to grow in faith and lessen our fears. Are you with me tonight? Grow in faith, lessen in fears. You know, it's going to be that battle. It's going to be that back and forth. And so when we let fear take control, when we let fear grow, then our faith is waning. So we need to grow in faith. So tonight, as we look at overcoming fear in the storm, and that's what we want to focus on. As I studied this and look at this again, like many times, it tends to explode on me. And we got so many truths. So tonight, as we look at the truth and look at the lesson tonight, what God would have for us, we need to learn how to overcome fear in your storm. You may be in a storm now. You may be, we often say we're either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or getting ready to go into one. Storms are a part of life, but how we approach those storms, how we live in those storms is how it makes a difference. How many believe that everybody goes through storms? We think, somehow we think we're the only one. No. We're all going through storms. I go through storms. You go through storms. So let's learn an overcoming fear in the storms tonight. But by way of introduction, we want to catch some things about the master of the storms, and that's Jesus Christ. We look at this and we see the storm that the disciples were in. We see him coming to the storm. We see Peter walking in a storm, and that's going to be part of the focus tonight. But as we look at our master, as we look at our Savior, as we go preparing for the storm, just by way of introduction, understanding and remembering what our Lord's about, we see just by introduction, we see his cares. Jesus has cares also. Jesus on this planet, Jesus on this earth, Jesus in the flesh, before he got his resurrected body as he walked with men, he had cares in this life. We know the Bible says Jesus wept. We know he got weary. We know he got tired. We know he was in pain. In this story, it's an amazing story. We find Jesus' cares. In Matthew 14, 1 through 13, we find about John the Baptist being beheaded. Jesus said there was no greater than John the Baptist as far as preachers go. But not only that, you remember that John the Baptist baptized Jesus. But if you think a little bit more, John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. Close enough that we remember when Mary found out she was going to be expecting and when she was going to be delivering that, she went and lived for a while with Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mother. She went to her cousin, Elizabeth. So Elizabeth was Mary's cousin, and John the Baptist then would be Jesus' cousin. And close enough, if Mary would go visit, I would think while growing up, there was probably some times that Jesus played with John the Baptist. Jesus spent some time. It's not in the Bible, but, it, but it's, it's, it's to be expected. If Mary would go spend some time with Elizabeth and John the Baptist would grow up, no doubt Jesus had played with John the Baptist, spent some time with John the Baptist. He allowed John the Baptist to baptize him. He sang there's no greater than John the Baptist. And John the Baptist then was, <coughs> excuse me, beheaded. Had lost his life. And if you notice there, in verse number 12 of, of Matthew 14, and his disciples came and took up the body of John the Baptist and buried us and went and told Jesus. So Jesus hears. Yeah, we know Jesus knew it was going to happen. He knew it was transpired. But in his heart, it says, verse 13, And when Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. He decided, he heard about John the Baptist. He knew no doubt it was going to happen. But still, he was heartbroken. Still, it affected his life. It affected the fact he thought about uh, his, John the Baptist's parents. He thought about Mary and all those things and his own friend, if you will, his own cousin. And how he says, so he said, I'm just going to get apart. Just going to take a break. Just going to get away. To deal with the loss. But when we see his cares, we also see his compassions. It didn't work out that way. Verse 14. So Jesus went out. Verse 13. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by a ship and the desert played a part. So he said, I got, I'm going to get a part a little bit. He said, let's, let's get away for a little bit. Let me cope with this because it's when he heard that John the Baptist was dead. And said, so when the people heard thereof, not that John the Baptist was dead, but that Jesus had gone apart, to, uh, uh, taken a place apart, they followed him on foot out of the cities. 
And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion towards them, and he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him. It's a desert place, and we find him feeding the 5,000. So even though, he had com- even though he was pulling apart, even though he had a loss, even though he had some cares, even though he says, boy, it's been tough. He said, let's just get away. Let me, let me deal with this. Let me take this. Let me, let me pause and think about this. When he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion, and he healed their sick, and then he fed them. The five thousand. In other words, as a leader, he couldn't always get away and just take a break. As a leader, he couldn't get away and say, well, let me just cope with this just a little bit. As a spiritual leader, as a spiritual servant, by the way, you cannot always care for your own cares. Your own cares can't be number one. Your own cares can't always be what's on top. Your own cares can't be what you always have to deal with. We have to deal with that because as spiritual leaders, Sometimes you have to put your own sorrows on the back burner. Now, we don't get excited about that, but that's, that's Bible teaching. If you go back and just take some time, I was reading this last week or so, reading through the Bible. When God put Aaron as the high priest, he says, Now, yeah, when their family dies, they can't defile themselves with the body. Aaron has to stay pure. Clean. Because when a person died, the priest or that person who dealt with the body, touching the dead body, would be unclean and couldn't go through. And he said, Aaron can't do that. Aaron's going to have to make sure he stays away, even from the body of his own family. The prophet Ezekiel. God says, tonight your wife's going to die. He says, but tomorrow I want you to preach to the people. And the Bible says that's what happened. At night his wife died. In the morning he did what he was commanded. See, that's hard. No, sometimes we have to understand that we have to minister to people in spite of our burdens. Sometimes we have to realize we have to minister to people in spite of our own sorrows, whether it be Ezekiel with his wife dying in the night and God saying, I want you to go preach in the morning, or Aaron because the fact that his own family might die, he said, don't, don't, don't touch the bodies, keep yourself pure, there's still work to be done. Is Jesus here, the death of his cousin, his friend John the Baptist, the greatest among preachers, he said, among women uh, that was born, he had to deal with that. You say, preacher, what does that have to do with me? Parents, sometimes you're going to have to get outside yourself and not just let your burdens affect your kids. Sometimes we're going to have to say, no, wait a minute. I know I've got a heartache. I've got a burden. I've got a uh, care. But because of our compassion for others, sometimes we have to get outside ourselves. Hello. Jesus gives that example that sometimes we have to look beyond our own cares. We have to look beyond our own burdens, beyond our own heartaches, so we can minister to others. And so John the Baptist was dead, and Jesus said, "Why?" Well, when he heard of it, he said, let's get apart. Let's go to a desert place, and let's, let's pull apart. But the people followed, and the Bible says he saw, saw them, had compassion on them, and he began to heal their sick. And then it was evening time. It was time for them to eat. And so he fed the five thousands. Wow, what a day. So we see our Lord, we think of His cares, we think of His compassion for others. But then we see He did get some comfort in verse 23. After the feeding of the 5,000, and in verse 22, and straightway Jesus constrained His disciples to get in the ship and to go before Him to the other side while He sent the multitudes away. And when He had sent the multitudes away, now finally... He went up to a mountain apart to pray. And when the even was come, he was there alone. Only now he got the chance to get alone to pray. Only now he began to be able to get apart, spend some time with the Father, get some consolation and get some comfort. Not saying we shouldn't always be so hard, but you know, there are just times as leaders, as parents, as mothers, you're going to have to say, I'm going to put my burdens aside for just a little bit. I'm going to have to put my heaviness aside for just a little bit because there are people I have compassion on. There's people that I have to lead. There's people I have to, to look to. But we are so selfish, we think the whole world stops when we have a problem. Guess what? The whole world doesn't stop when we have a problem. The whole world doesn't just kind of back off. No, we have to see what God would have us do. And then after those things, many times, you mothers, you understand that. 
that after it's all said and done, after the babies are taken care of, after the children are taken care of, yes, after your husband is taken care of sometimes, then you can get alone and deal with the grandparents the same thing. So we just learn from that. So tonight, as we see, all that precedes this night of the storm. All that we proceed, we see precedes this night of Peter walking on the water. So let's learn the lessons tonight about how to overcome fear in the storms. How we can do that. Jesus here, he's had his storm through the day. He's had his care with John the Baptist, his cousin, his friend, his preacher, if you will, that baptized him. His one that would say greatest among women. He's been dead and he tried to get away and he couldn't get away and it's been a long day and a long night and he's weary and now they're into the storm so let's learn tonight how to overcome the fears in the storm i don't know about you but i need to how to overcome the fear in the storms there's going to be storms we're going to have storms how to overcome the fears number one here we go so stay with me tonight we need to rest in the messages of the storm we need to rest in the messages of the storm we find some wonderful truths in here that'll help you overcome those fears when the storms come. Number one, rest in the message of the storm. We see number one, sometimes Jesus sends us into the storm. Sometimes Jesus sends us into the storm. Look at verse 22. And straight away Jesus constrained. That means he forced, he pushed, he twisted their arm a little bit. He put pressure on them. Uh, his disciples to get in the ship and to go before him to the other side while he sent the multitude away. Do you understand that Je Jesus knew the storm was coming? Jesus knew they were going to go into the storm. Jesus knew they were going to have troubles. Jesus knew the storm was coming, but he still sent them into the storm. You have to realize just because you're in a storm doesn't mean you're outside the will of God. That's why it's important you know that you're in the will of God. So when the storm comes, you say, no, Jesus put me here. Jesus sent me here. I'm following his instructions. I'm following his command. And so when the storm comes, I don't have to be afraid because the Lord sent me into the storm. You say, preacher, why would Jesus send us into a storm? Sometimes to build our faith. Amen. I mean, that's what happened here. They saw how Jesus could take care of them. They could see how Jesus calmed the storm. So sometimes Jesus puts us into the storm to build our faith so he can do a work in our life and in our faith. Number, number two, sometimes he sends us into, storm, into the storm to test our faith. Let me help you with something. The testing of our faith isn't for him to see. It's for us to see. You follow what I'm saying? Jesus already knows about our faith. But when our faith is tested, we get to see what our faith is like. We get to see how strong our faith is. We get to see, in fact, that yes, we can live by faith. We can walk by faith. We can live by faith. And number three, sometimes God sends us into the storm, hang on, for others. Well, why am I in this storm? Maybe it's not about you. Maybe it's about somebody else that you're there to protect. Maybe it's somebody else there that you need to encourage. Maybe it's somebody else there that, that you need to, to build up and encourage and say, no, you don't understand. I've met with God. I prayed and I know I'm in the will of God and this is what God's going to teach us in this storm but see we are so wrapped up in ourselves that when the storms come it's all about us it's not always about us sometimes we're just along for the ride sometimes it's like paul there on the storm as he said man he says don't you fear he said i know whom i serve that i met with the lord today and i've got something for us and god is going to lead us sometimes it's not all about us there's a passage that talks about in one of the storms he says and also there was some other little ship with them somehow we think it's all about us God's got a bigger picture so sometimes he sends us into the storm to build our faith sometimes he sends us into the storm to test our faith for us to know and sometimes he sends us into the storm for others so how can I find rest how can I find 
Help them to have peace in the storms and not be afraid. Realize that when, when I'm walking with God and I'm in the will of God, God sends us into the storm. Number two, how can I find rest in the messages from the storm? I know that Jesus sometimes sends us into the storm. Number two, Jesus always sees us in the storm. He always sees us in the storm. Back there in Mark chapter 6 and verse 48, and when he was on the mountain praying, it says, and when he saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he was on the mountain. He was far away. He was far away, away from the storm. He was on the mountain praying. But he saw them. You say, how can he see him? Because he's God. Amen. They could not see Jesus. In fact, when he was coming off the mountain and walking through them in a storm, they couldn't even recognize him then. But though they could not see him, we know that he saw us. That's like I was preaching the other night, looking to the one who watches us. I'm glad he always sees us. Amen. So you say, preacher, how, how, can I, how can I deal with this fear and this storm? There's some financial issues going on. There's some health issues going on. My family has some struggles. I don't know how it's going to go on. I'm afraid of a loss. I'm out of control. I don't know what's going to happen. How can I find peace? How can I deal with this fear? Just realize that he's watching. Even as they were rowing, even as they were struggling, even as they had the heartache, he was watching. He saw their fatigue. He said he saw them toiling in rowing. He said, Preacher, I'm so tired in this storm. When you think about it, and there was the fourth watch of the night when he came to them. The fourth watch of the night was somewhere between three in the morning and six in the morning. And they'd been already up all day. They'd already been working all day and now rowing in the storm all night. They were, let me give you a, a Greek word here. They were whooped with a capital W. I mean, they, they were tired. He saw their fatigue. He saw, that's what the Bible says. He saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. He saw their fatigue. He saw their fighting. They're fighting against the storm. They're fighting against the waves. Have you ever had a time in your life you take two steps forward and you're getting ready to say and you go back one step? No, you go take two steps forward and you go back three. Hello? You've been there where you end up at the end of the day worse off than you were. Less farther. You didn't go any farther. You went backward for the day. And so no doubt that's what it was. They didn't have that far necessarily to row, but they were there rowing. Now it's been some 10 hours, 9 hours, 10 hours they've been rowing if they started at 6 o'clock at night. And they were still out in the middle of the sea. They were still out in the storm. So he saw their fight. I'm, I'm glad that you say, Preacher, I've got them. I'm afraid in the storm. Don't be afraid. He sent us here. Don't be afraid. He sees us here. And don't be afraid. He sees our fears. He sees our our fightings, he sees our fatigue, he sees us in the storm. I don't see him, I don't have to see him, I just know he sees me. So we can just rest in the messages of the storm. He sends us into the storm. He sees us in the storm. Praise the Lord, Jesus can always save us in the storm. He can save us in the storm. You say, what about the times where people got in a storm and they didn't get saved? I, he could have. He decided he was not going to. But I'm glad he can save us in the storm. Notice what it says in Matthew 14, 49. There is not Matthew 14, 39. Let's look at verse 25. Matthew 14, 25. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. I'm glad he can come to us in the storm. Well, when you're in the storm and you think nobody can reach you, he can reach you. When you think nobody's going to show up, he can show up. I'm glad he always shows up just in time. And there it was in the fourth watch of the night. He didn't come in the third watch of the night. He didn't come in the second watch of the night. They... <coughs> They were rowing. They were tired. They were still going. The storm was still there. The wet waves and the wind were still contrary. And finally, Jesus showed up. Well, he's never late, but seldom early. He came. He comes to us in the storm. He can save us. He comes to us. He calls to us in the storm. Verse 26. And when disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is the Spirit. And they cried out for fear. And straightway Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. 
You know, we got to be listening for Jesus. When you're in a storm, say, Preacher, how can I find rest in the storm? How can I find this fear I've got? How can I subdue? Listen for the Lord. Listen for the Lord. You say, how can I? Listen to the Lord. How can I get in that closet and listen to the Lord in the storm while you're rolling? Say, God, I've got to hear from you. By the way, if you open your ears and you open your heart and you look to him, when he shows up, you can hear him. You can hear him. He comes to us. He calls to us. And then he calms us. He calms us. First, he calms our heart. He said, be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. He wants our hearts calm in the storm. He didn't calm the storm and said, now settle down. No, he said, you settle down. Then later on, he calmed the storm. He calmed the circumstances. But first, he wants to calm our hearts. How to find, how to fight fear. How to overcome fear in the storm. Number one, rest in the messages of that old storm. I'm glad he sees. I'm glad we can say, well, I'm here because God sent me here. And he can save me. Number two, listen, this will help us how to overcome fear. You say, preacher, I'm afraid, I know. Number two, reach for a miracle in the storm. Reach for a miracle in the storm. Notice what it says. Verse 27, and straightway Jesus spake unto them and say, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. You know, the storm is still going, the waves are still contrary, it's still a mess out there, they're still tired. And Jesus said, If I don't be afraid, we can say, Woo, glory, I'm glad it's him. I'm glad I don't have to be afraid. I'm glad I'm supposed to have good cheer. And in verse 28, And Peter answered and said unto him, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee in the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter saw, came to come out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous and was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come unto the ship, the wind ceased. Three miracles we find in this passage. Three miracles. Miracle number one, Jesus walking on the water. That's a miracle. But you know, we don't get real excited about that because you know what? We're not surprised. If you've been saved very long and you know what God has done, you've read the Bible, you're not too surprised. You know why? Because Jesus is God. You know, if we could just take that confidence and say, well, I'm not surprised Jesus is walking on the water. He's Jesus. You ought to say, well, I'm not surprised God can take care of me. He's God. I'm not surprised Jesus sent me in the storm. He's Jesus. I'm not surprised He can come walking on the water out to me in the storm. He's Jesus. But reach for a miracle. Number one, Jesus walking on the water. That's a miracle. But no big deal. That's what Jesus does. He does miracles. Second miracle is Jesus calming the water. It says when they got back in, verse 32, and when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. And when they were in the ship, came and worshiped, ship came and worshiped, saying, Oh, the truth, thou art the Son of God. Else place they were amazed. Later on in another storm, he says, Peace, be still. And it stopped. And they were just amazed. So it's a miracle. He calmed the water. But again, it's not a big deal. He's, he's God. Miracle number three. Here's the big miracle. Jesus calling Peter to walk on the water. That is the miracle that surprises us. That is the miracle that changes things. That is the miracle that we say, wow, Peter walking on the water. Yeah, let me help you with something. Peter did not do the miracle. Peter could have said to his disciples, in fact, if it was the next day, and they were out there, I can just see Peter out there. Next day, they're out in the water. He says, watch this. I walked in the water last night. I can walk on the water today. I got news for you. He wouldn't have fared at all. It was not Peter doing the miracle. It was God doing the miracle in Peter. See, it's all about him. When we start saying, watch, watch me, those are famous last words from Texas, isn't it, you know? Hey, watch this. Ooh, no. He did that. I can do that too. No, no. It was God doing the miracle in Peter. 
when we realize it's God that wants to do the miracle in us, wow, that makes a difference. The biggest miracle, miracle number three, was Jesus calling Peter to walk on the water. Very quickly, let's notice it. See, this one, so you preach, preacher, I'm in a storm. How can I get over my fear in a storm? All right, learn the lessons we read. That. Rest in that what we learned from the storm. Rest in those things. But then also, why don't you go ahead and reach out for a miracle in the storm. Say, God, do something special in my life in this storm. Show me something special in my life in this storm. Show me your power in my life in this storm. Show me what you can do in me and through me in this storm. Yes, I'm tired. Yes, I'm weary. Yes, I'm afraid. And yes, the storm is still raging and I'm glad you come by. I'm glad you spoke to me. I'm glad you told me to have courage. But God, I think you brought me out here to do something a little bit more. I think there's something else we can do. God, give me joy. Give me peace. Help me reach somebody. Help me see somebody saved. Help me give the gospel to somebody. Have me strengthen somebody. Help me grow in my faith. You and I need to reach out for a miracle, not because I can do it, not because I just want to see something God doing, but I want to help God use me to do something for his glory. Notice very quickly, first of all, Peter's call of faith. Peter's call of faith. There he said, verse 28, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come to thee on the water. Boy, he wanted God to do something great in his life. When's the last time you asked God to do help you do something by faith? When's the last time you said, God, show me what you want me to do that's outside my ability, that's outside my skill set, that's outside my knowledge, that's outside my strength? Again, not tempting God, but saying, God, I want you to do something in my life. I want you to, to show yourself strong in my life. His call of faith. He wanted God to do something great in his life. When's the, what are you calling on God? What are you asking God to do right now by faith in your life? What is it you, that you're saying, God, I'm in a storm. I don't know how it's going to go. But God, I'm going to ask you to do something in my life that's going to be all of you. That's going to be all of your power and all your might and all your glory and all your working. God, it's one thing for you to walk on the sea. It's one thing you do. But he said, I want you to do something in my life. Peter's call of faith. Boy, we need to seek God to do something in our lives by faith. See, Peter's call of faith. Number two, Peter's compliance in faith. His compliance in faith. Verse 28, And Peter answered and said unto him, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come out on the water, come to thee on the water. And he said, Come. Jesus said, Come. Yeah, if this had been most of us Baptists, we'd say, Can't hear you, Lord, the storm's too loud. But did you did you say something, Jesus? I'm not sure. I'm sure. Did you say come or wait? I couldn't quite get that. And, and when do you want me to come, Lord? But how about tomorrow? Is that is, 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 is a little bit? We we wait an hour. Did, when do you want? Me? And he said, "Come." And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Peter's compliance. Well, it's one thing to have a call of faith. It's another thing to comply in faith. To say, okay, God. Guess what? We got a whole book of calls of faith. God said, I want you to do this. Well, well, God, I don't see how it is. That's by faith. I'm just going to obey by faith. I'm just going to respond by faith. I'm going to the just, the saved, shall live by faith. Three times in the Bible it tells us that. And God says it once, it's important. God says it twice, it's double important. We says three. I think we better pay attention. He said, Come, and when Peter came out of the water. Oh, I'm asking you, I said, number one, what are we asking God for to do for us to do for us by faith? Number two, what has God already told us to do by faith that we need to start doing? See, preacher, I need to, I need to, how to overcome fear. They reach out for a miracle. Look for God to do something in your life by faith, and then comply by faith in the storm. See, miracles are generally found in the storm. Generally found when there's problems. Generally found when there's a need. As I was talking to the kids in the, in the, in the school, you're sitting there with your diet Snapple iced tea, sitting there on the rocking chair on the front porch, nice summer afternoon, about 85 degrees, a little breeze blowing, not a cloud in the sky. Boy, you're feeling good. You just got a pay raise and you just got the income tax return back and you got all the money. You got, you're satisfied. Everybody's healthy. The, the bills are all paid. In fact, you think you're going to be able to pay off that charge card and boy, the house goes, and it's just good. Hey, what are you doing up there? Just waiting for a miracle. No. 
Spirit was having to say, God, I don't know how I'm going to do this. God, wait, I need to. That's beyond my control. I, I'm, out, I'm, out of, I'm out of ideas. Lord, if it be you, do something. He tells us what to do, it, and we do it by faith. There's where the miracles come. So, how can I overcome fear? Reach out for a miracle. I'm, they were afraid, and he said, Lord, if it's you, he says, he didn't say, make me feel better. In fact, he didn't say, Lord, if it be you, stop the storm. He said, Lord, if it be you, help me step out into that storm. And then we find Peter's compliance. But, oh, but then we find Peter's collapse of faith. Do you ever start out in faith and then lose your faith? Most of us do that. We get about one step out and say, oh, boo, oh, boy. Because we do just like Peter. His, his collapse of faith. His focus was lost. He lost his focus. Verse 28, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come to thee on the water. When he wanted to come to thee. He wasn't looking just to walk in the water. He wanted to come to him on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Period. He was walking on the water to go to Jesus. But, verse 30, when he saw the wind, got his eyes off of Christ, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. He lost his focus. How does our faith collapse? We lose our focus. We get our eyes off the Word. We get our eyes off the Lord. We get our eyes off what God's doing. And we think about what we're doing. I stepped out and now, Lord, I don't know. You know what's exciting is Peter was walking on what he was afraid of. Hello? He was walking on top of what he was afraid of. That's walking by faith. I'm afraid of this, but I'm going to walk on it anyway because God told me to. I don't know. I, at that depth is what I was afraid of, but I'm by faith. I'm trusting Christ and I'm walking. That's what's exciting when you let God help us with our faith so we walk on top of what we were afraid of. But he lost his focus. He got his eyes off the Lord and got his eyes on the storms. Got eyes. The storm was there already. He'd seen the storms already, but he stopped focusing on the Lord and started focusing again on the storms. And when that happened, his fear was loose. His fear was loose. Notice what it says. Verse 30. And when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. When did he begin to sink? Not just when he got his eyes off, but when he got afraid. It loosed his fear. See, we lose our focus and we get fearful again. That's why you need to stay in the book. That's why i got to stay in the book, especially in the storms. That's why, our, that's why when the storms come, don't lessen your prayer time. Build your prayer time. Don't pray less. Pray more. Don't read less. Read more. Don't witness less. Witness more. Don't go to church less. Go to church more. Because we've got to keep that focus. And we lose the focus where fear gets loosed. And when the fear gets loose, failure begins to loom. And he began to sink. Well, I started a miracle, but I fell through. Oh, notice Peter was caught by faith. He was caught by faith. Verse 30, when he saw the wind boisterous, and he was afraid and beginning to sink. I don't know how fast he was sinking. I don't know if it was, hello, I don't know. I don't know if it was just kind of quick sandy, you know, and just kind of going down, this has got too good, I'm not too sure. Or it was just, oh, God. I don't know. But beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. He cried out to Jesus. I'm glad we can always cry out to Jesus. Oh, he said, preacher, my faith is well. And cry out to Jesus. But I'm drowning my faith. Is, he said, cry out to Jesus. But, Peter, I but Jesus, I don't know. But, God, but preacher, I don't know what to do. Cry out to Jesus. He cried out to Jesus. I like the fact he was caught up by Jesus. And when he saw the wind boisterous and was afraid, beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me, and immediately stretched forth his hand and caught him. It doesn't say Peter caught Jesus. Jesus caught Peter. Amen. Uh, somehow, somehow I got the idea, oh, Peter and his strength, and so Peter, no, he just cried, and Jesus reached out and caught him and said to him, oh, him, a little faith. And I, I like the fact he continued back with Jesus. And when they were come unto the ship, the wind ceased. Whether he walked back with him or carried him back, I don't know, but he came on back with Jesus. Oh, storms are coming. How to overcome fear? Let's rest in the lessons. 
We know those lessons. That God sends us into the storm. God sees us in the storm. We, well, we, we've heard that. We've known that. But rest in that. Don't forget those things. Then reach out for a miracle. Say, God, what are you going to do? Do something. Help me grow in this. Help me be more used of you in this. God, do something special. Not for my sake, but for God, I'm in the storm. Let's do something that's memorable in the storm. Let's do something that's profitable in the storm. Let's grow in the storm. God, help me be used of you in the storm. Let in the storm that you be glorified and you be magnified while I'm in this storm. Reach, Boy, that will help you subdue some fears in your life as you look for God to do a work. Then lastly, regard the moral of the storm. Regard the moral of the storm. We know about the, the morals of all the fairy tales and things we read about and uh, fables and there's always a moral. What's the moral of the story of the storm here? Ch Mark chapter 6 verse 52. I see this is the moral. Verse 51 of Mark 6, same event. Just doesn't lay out Peter's story. And he went up unto them into the ship, and when the, sins, when the wind ceased, they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. They couldn't get over it. Look at this. He got on board and the wind stopped. He got on board and the weaves ceased. I just can't. They just beyond measure. They were just beside themselves. They were just just unbelievable. They could not understand it. They could not believe it. They could not believe their eyes. By the way, that shows their lack in faith. They shouldn't have been surprised. We shouldn't be surprised, but we are when God does something. Then it tells us why. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Regarding the moral of the storm, beware the hardened heart. Check your heart. Let's don't have a hard heart in the storm. Their hearts were hardened in the storm. Instead of being softened in the storm, instead of looking to the Lord in the storm, their hearts were hardened. Beware a hardened heart. The moral, preacher, I'm in a storm. Be careful you don't get your heart hardened. Be careful you do not get bitter because of that. Very quickly, the cause. The cause of a hardened heart was fear and fatigue. See, when we get afraid, we're liable to get a hard heart. When we get weary and tired, we tend to get a hard heart. I'm tired. I'm, I'm wore out. I'm, I'm afraid of this. And we begin to get a heart that's hardened. We don't care about other people's feelings. We say things we ought not. We do things we ought not. And we focus on ourselves and our heart becomes hardened. It says their hearts were hardened. See, fear and fatigue will cause your spirit to be down. Fear and fatigue will cause your heart to be hardened. It says in Numbers 21.4, talking about the children of Israel, and they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom, and the soul of the people was much discouraged. Their hearts and their soul was discouraged. Their hearts and, dis were, and souls were, were cast down because of the way. They were tired and they were hard working and it was just a hard time they were going through some kind of emotional storms there and their souls got discouraged here we find the disciples as they were weary and during the storm i can almost hear them as they're roaring why did jesus send us out here and the wind was going why did jesus do didn't he know? he must have known a storm was coming and he doesn't seem to care and he's not even out here with us he we're out here roaring and john you're not doing your job over there roll harder over there hey peter what, what are you doing over there napping stop looking over there who who don't put that, put that coffee down, Peter, and get over here and roll on here. And boy, they began to be upset. They began to get tired and they began fearful and their hearts were hardened because they were fearful and they were fatigued. Elijah, God, just, just kill me, God, because he was tired and fatigued and afraid of what Jezebel was going to do. Well, regard that moral of the story that when you go in the storm, how can I, how can I overcome fear? Make sure my heart stays soft. Make sure my heart is not hardened. The cause was fear and fatigue, and the consequences is forgetfulness. Notice what it says, verse 52. Again, back up. They were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wonder. Beyond what we can... They were just amazed. For or because they considered not the miracle of the loaves. Because their heart was hardened. Because their heart was hardened, they didn't consider the miracle of the loaves. In other words, they forgot the miracle. They just saw the feeding of the 5,000. 
just before, the day before Jesus says go, they just, they, they just took the bread and a little bit of bread and a little bit of fish and fed 5,000 people. And boy, and brought up baskets of abundance. They had, so, they had just seen a great miracle. And now Jesus says go into the, And they forgot. They did not consider it. They did not remember. They did not think about the miracles of the loaves. See, when we get our hearts hardened because of that fatigue, because of fear, we get our hearts hardened. We forget the miracles God has already done for us. See, if, if Jesus did... If Jesus let us go into the storm, if Jesus sent us a storm, and we sank, and we drowned, and we lost everything we had, we're still saved. Amen. It's a miracle that he saved me. It's a miracle that I'm heading to heaven. As you're going down, and you're breathing in that water, you say, I guess this is it. Instead of saying, I guess this is it, you say, this is the start. Glory. Hallelujah. I'll be walking the streets in just a few minutes. Glory. Amen. Well, just because he saved us, that's enough. But we forget the miracles. We forget the last time we lost the job. We forget the last time we were sick. We forget the last time how God worked a miracle in our lives and restored somebody to us. And we forget all the blessings God has done. Why? Because we get tired and we get fatigued and we get afraid and our heart becomes hard and we just forget all God has done. Phil, but you understand, the doctor says it's cancer and, 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 and my wife is going to die. My kids are not doing this. Yeah, but don't forget the miracles of God and the blessings of God. He's done so much. Our hearts get hard because we get afraid and because we get fearful. Preacher, how can I get overcome fear in the storm? Let's rest in the messages of the storm. Read about the storms, how God took it. Just rest in that. Reach out for a miracle. God, do something special in this time because this is a special time. I don't think Peter said next time he says, Lord, teach me to walk on water. No, he said, it's in a storm. It's in a storm where you can find that extra growth. It's that storm where the trials come that build us and build our faith. And let's regard that moral. Beware of having a hard heart in the storms. That's where you need to say, God, soften my heart. See, when you begin to get tired, you begin to say, you know, I don't care anymore. Oh, no, no, no. Say, God, soften my heart. Don't let me forget. When you say, but, but nobody seems to care and it's just not... No, be, keep the soft heart. Keep the soft heart. And David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines. David, God had just done some miracles of protecting David, and now David got some fearful, all afraid all of a sudden, got tired, fatigued. He said, I guess I'm going to perish one day by the hand of Saul, and so he went and joined the enemy. Don't let your heart get hard. Storms are coming. Storms are coming. Overcome the fear in the storms. Let's bow our heads, please.